stuck in the notes as well. Let's go on to Trump. Let's, you know, what would our show be if we didn't spend some time? I know, I know. Criticizing we, Trump, we have to. Yeah. It is, it is an imperative. And today, actually, Trump gave me the opportunity to recycle this meme that I had so much fun with. I spent way too much time on, but people, it's one of these where I have to explain it and people don't get it. So whatever, but I call it my zombie economy meme. Trump was bragging yesterday about, you know, what a great job he's doing. The forgotten voters of the 2016 election are now doing great. The steel industry is rebuilding and expanding at a pace that it hasn't seen in decades. Our country has one of the best economies in many years, perhaps ever. Unemployment numbers best in 51 years. Wow. And for me, I think of this as the zombie economy that he is using government in a way to revive sectors of the economy that should have been dead essentially so it's the zombie economy right so we've got on my little meme if you're looking at it at don't let it go.com or twitter wherever you guys follow me um you've got the u.s steel zombie riding harley davidson oh, basically out of the country <laughs> because you know harley davidson is one of the companies that oh, has suffered thanks to trump's I mean, the tariffs, yeah, right? he, he's he is in a position to brag about the economy because the economy is doing well, uh, relatively speaking. It's, um, you know, uh, you know, he he's he's got the numbers on his side. Uh, they're nowhere near as good as he would like them to be. And that's, I guess, your next thing about him complaining about the Fed. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're nowhere near as, as good as he promised them to be. And. We're not seeing the bad stuff. When a recession comes, that's when you see the bad stuff. Uh, you know, George, uh, Bill Clinton had an economy that only grew throughout his entire administration, arguably at faster rates than under, than under Trump. The labor participation rate is improving, but nowhere near as fast. And it hasn't got to the levels that it was before the year 2000. Um, there's a bunch of numbers that suggest that it's not as good as Trump would like to say it is. On the other hand, it's it's good. You know, it's it certainly beats alternative, uh, and it's better than under Obama. And if he only ran, if he only ran on look, look at the wonderful things I'm doing for the economy, then I think he would be tolerable. But these kind of issues get minor reference by him he's much more interested in running on scaring people on um, on telling us how awful things are in spite of the great economy so if he just said look i deregulated i cut taxes the economy's doing well and and he left all the other stuff then fine but that's he spends very little time on this stuff and everything on the other stuff well the and stuff is, the, the fed stuff is interesting well, and, and that's the thing. I mean, first of all, he's, he's complaining because he wanted, and he wouldn't say exactly. He, he tells you the opposite of what he wanted, right? He says, quantitative tightening was a killer, should have done the exact opposite, which is, of course, quantitative easing. And if you look up quantitative easing, you know, the standard just Wikipedia explanation is the Fed directly in, injecting money into the economy by buying Buying bonds, so it's printing yeah. money. It's it's increasing the money directly available to banks. Although, I mean, it's complicated, but there wasn't real easing because the the money then flowed into bank reserves at the Fed. So it came out of one pocket, it went into another pocket, and nothing much changed. But um, but the 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 interesting thing is he's complaining because he says economic growth could have been four percent, but it's only three percent because of the Fed. And and this is my second, I guess, I told you so moment. Because I've said again for for a year at least, maybe two years, that when things go bad, Trump will use the Fed as a scapegoat. He will blame the Fed for what happened. He has set this up for months and months and months. He's been saying all along. Of course, he nominated this chairman, Powell. I was against Powell. I, I suggested that he nominate uh, the Professor, um, oh my God, Taylor, Taylor. Taylor from uh, Stanford, uh, but he didn't want to nominate Taylor because Taylor was an independent guy who wouldn't have done what Trump demanded of him. Powell 
is a nobody, stands for nothing, reminds mm -hmm. me a little of Trump, complete pragmatist, has no ideology, has no economic point of view, and Trump thought he could bully him, and it turns out that Trump indeed can bully him. Mm -hmm. But he's going to complain about him anyway, because uh, if it, whatever Powell does, Trump will complain. If he lowers interest rates and we get inflation, it'll be, or we get something else, it'll be Powell's fault if it's bad. If he doesn't lower interest rates or if he increases interest rates and the economy slows down, he'll blame Powell, um, he'll blame the Fed. So he's got this wonderful out of blaming anything bad on, uh, on the Fed and he's already doing it. So he keeps setting it up. So if we do have a recession, when we do have a recession, he'll have a fall guy. Yeah. And here he's just saying, oh, well, it would be even better than it is if. And I mean, what would, the, is it actually that the GDP would be that or just the numbers would reflect? I mean, does GDP mean anything if you can manipulate it just by quantitative easing, right? Oh, it means economic growth and it's adjusted for inflation. So, yeah, I mean, you can manipulate GDP. You can manipulate a lot of economic numbers. But I mean, does it mean real productivity then? Right? Yeah, in the short run. The question is what happens in the long run. It's like cutting taxes. You cut taxes and yes, the economy grows in the short run. You know, that's completely understandable. But if you, if you don't cut spending and you amass huge okay. deficit, you're sacrificing the future for the present, you 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 actually now you're also distorting the present because there's a lot of malinvestment going on because of all the government spending, but you're also sacrificing the future for the present. So you're giving up on future growth in order to attain present growth, which is what Trump has done, particularly with the tax cuts and the government spending out of control. And yes, people are feeling good. I mean, people, you know, there are jobs, the economy is chugging along, um, all of that, you know, is true. And Trump should and is going to take credit for it. Um, some of us should point out the cost of all these things and the long-term cost that we're going to pay for, for all of this, so for all of this short-term economic growth. Um, I don't think anybody's listening. I don't think anybody will listen to us because everybody is enamored with what's happening right now, but you can't run a, a trillion dollar annual deficit and think, Unless you're, you know, one of these MMT, unless you're OEC, which I think Trump is very similar to in many respects, um, you can run trillion dollar deficits without there being a consequence. And Trump and Republicans have done nothing to try to reduce those deficits. We're already at 22 trillion, I think, of total uh, debt. It's only going to increase dramatically uh, under Trump. And then now it could take a long time before that manifests itself. You could say, to hell with it in the long run, we're all dead, which is what Keynes said. And so who cares about the long run? But the fact is that you, yes, feel good now, enjoy it because it ain't gonna last forever. And at some point you're gonna pay for it. Now it could be that you won't even know that you paid for it. That's the other thing about economics. Often we don't know that we're paying for it because mm -hmm. the economy might grow for decades at 2% and we could have grown for decades at 4%. And the difference between 2 to 4% is unbelievable when you compound. Right, it's right. the difference between the wealth we have today in the United States and what Mexico has. Imagine if we'd grown to 2% less every year for the last 50 years, we'd be as rich as Mexico. So the difference is that compounding and that's, it's massive. So that's the problem with economics, the, 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 the problem with life, right? The path you didn't take, mm -hmm. you can't visualize. You, it's not real to you. I, you know, I can hypothetically tell you the, you know, what I think would have happened, but I can't show you. I can't point to it, and that makes people, particularly if they're concrete bound, it makes people. Uh, it makes it impossible for them to actually observe the damage being done. There's enormous, unbelievable damage being done to the U.S. economy right now by this administration, by past administration, by everybody since the Bush administration, and, and everybody for the last 100 years. But, but it's definitely significant over the last two administrations. But much of that damage is not being seen. The economy since Obama has grown nicely. There were no recessions under Obama. Uh, the economy grew, and it, that, that economic growth has accelerated a little bit, a little bit under, under Trump. 
but the distortions, the perversions, the, the, the bad investments, the bad stuff un, that underpins, that is in the background, we can't observe. And when the recession comes, it'll be blamed on capitalism. It won't be blamed on any of these things. And it certainly won't be blamed on Trump or Obama or anybody. Yeah. And, and that's why, you know, if I get the opportunity when I do these tweets, and actually, I think this this tweet, the one about the Trump sounding like a capitalist. Oh, wait, no, it's not that one. It's the next one that Shapiro actually retweeted for me. But, um, you know, I will, when he is not sounding like a capitalist at all, call it out because so many people say, oh, he's a capitalist. Yeah. And he is no such thing. Yeah. He yeah. is calling for quantitative easing. He's calling for the Fed to inject money, print money. That is, that, you know, as long as we have a Fed, there are circumstances in which the Fed has to inject money. If we have a Fed, you have to, and, and what they did, uh, much of what they did as a financial crisis, given that we had to have a Fed, was they actually didn't inject enough money. So one of the problems both in 2008 and in the Great Depression was that the Fed did not inject enough money. In the Great Depression, they actually sucked money out of the economy just when mm. it needed so they created this credit deflationary cycle in the Great Depression. And arguably in 2008, they were not fast enough and not aggressive enough in injecting money. Given that you have a Fed, it has to act. It has to do something. To the, the, the pretense of it can just stay out of it and do nothing is a misnomer because they're doing something every day. That's what they are. They're the Fed. They're the central bank. And not doing anything is doing something. It's, mm -hmm. it's actually... so. This is why you need somebody like John Taylor to be at the, as long as there's a Fed and it's going to act semi-rationally, you need it to act based on some kind of rule that determines when you inject money and when you don't inject money and how much money and how, what are the criteria. Right now, and this is true under Bernanke and it's certainly true under Powell, it's completely arbitrary and random. It is whatever the Fed chairman and the committee decide and their models, their statistics are, are very, very, very bad and arbitrary so um it, it's it's not economics so they, they are is it based on pressure group stuff so it's sort of like a crony decision not so much pressure group stuff. the fed is somewhat immune from pressure groups although the banks are pressure groups with the fed but it's 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 relatively not that um but it's it's much more the um uh it's an arbitrary function. It's a non-market function, it's a central planning function. You can do it really, really badly or a little less bad, but it's always going to be bad. And the little less bad would have been, um, would have been appointing John Taylor, who would have imposed the Taylor rule, and that would have been a little less bad. Still would have been bad. It still would have created problems. So is, is the like idea that you, um, you add more money as necessary to... Uh, permit an increase in production in goods and services to flow properly through the economy because there is a real increase or something? Is that? Yeah, so what happens during things like a financial crisis is there is a true, you know, it, 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 because credit is being destroyed, credit being destroyed means people are, uh, are, are, are not paying back their debt. Banks are not lending money. There is a massive contraction in the amount of money that exists out there and people, because people can't borrow money and because banks suddenly see all these, you know, they, they shut everything out. And what you get is this, uh, is the spiral where it gets worse and worse and worse and worse, which was what happened during the great depression. And what usually happens is, you know, in a, in a free banking system that would, uh, the whole thing would have never happened, right? The, the dynamic, that whole dynamic would have never happened. But be, and, and a lot of that dynamic is that there was a lot of money being freed up by the central bank leading up to this collapse. So central bank needs during periods in which that collapse is happening to, in a sense, you know, uh, back up the banking system with liquidity, back, back it up with financial resources, with money to facilitate the continuation of economic and financial transactions. And that would... Now, again, there's no way to do that without some kind of long-term bad consequences, but it's all you have. It's all you have. So you have to do something because the short-term economic consequences can be so negative as to justify 
the action. There's so many things like this. So, you know, what do you do about North Korea now that we're in this horrible, you know, position where anything that we do, we're maybe putting South Korea at risk or ourselves at risk or, huh? You don't wave a communist flag with the leader of one of the most brutal dictatorships in the world. Right, right. But there's there's so many things like this in which our government has been pursuing a wrong, immoral, destructive policy for decades, century or more, whatever. And in order to survive the short term at all, you have to continue in some way that policy. But then, of course, the question is you have to do it with an eye to getting out and doing something better, which Trump has no idea. And you're saying if he had appointed Taylor, there would have been some idea of working towards something better, or is it just at least mitigating the damage now? It would have mitigated some of the damage. I mean, again, I'm I'm not saying that John Taylor would have been perfect because I don't think you can be a perfect chairman of the Fed, but there's a difference between appointing somebody who's a nobody and a nothing, and therefore is swayed by the wind, and appointing somebody who at least has a rule, the market know what the rule is, it creates some stability and predictability, and it helps the market know what's going on. You know, whenever you have an institution like the Fed or, or bad foreign policy, like with North Korea or the Middle East, what you need to do is start unwinding the bad foreign policy. You need to start unwinding. And the first thing to do with the Fed is put it on a rule-based system and then ultimately dissolve it. But, you know, nobody's talking about dissolving it. So at least make it as predictable as possible. At least make it so that people understand what it's doing, why it's doing, when it's doing it. And then markets can adjust fairly well to predictable changes in interest rates and predictable changes in in, uh, the money supply. What they don't like is finger in the wind, pragmatic, unprincipled uh, type behavior, which is what Powell is exhibiting. Right. Uh, And and what Trump is exhibiting. So, so, you uh, uh, you know, the one thing, the reason I think the economy is doing well is that the one thing that Trump has been semi-predictable on is that he's generally loose, loosening up the regulatory burden on companies, not in a kind of a massive systematic legislative scale that is needed, but at least the regulatory agencies are somewhat hands-off and are giving space to businessmen to invest and to grow and to build and to create stuff. Because he's not fighting the legislative battle, it's easily reversible when yes. the next president comes in. Or it's- with the court challenges, right? Because he's been trying to do some of that with Obamacare and then the courts undo what he's doing, right? Yeah, the only way to do it is to pass legislation. That's the system we live in is the system of laws. And it, 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 and that's what Jimmy Carter and uh, Ronald Reagan did. Actually, President Ford and then Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan did when they deregulated many American businesses in the 1970s and 80s was it was through legislation, through massive bipartisan, massive pieces of legislation that actually deregulated American business. And it would be one thing if you said, you can't do it because Congress won't do it, but nobody's tried. And it, there's been no effort by the administration to do it. There's there'd be no using the bully pulpit to do it. There's been no massive legislation proposed that was then rejected by you know Democrats or Republicans or whatever. It just hasn't been that. It's just been behind the scenes at the regulatory agency's deregulation, which is better than nothing, but very, very reversible. Also, I mean, it's true that the tax cuts and other things are making businesses, they have more money, uh, you know, because because they primarily the corporate tax rate is being cut, which is a good thing. Um, but, you know, not everybody has more money because a lot of people's personal taxes have actually gone up. But in terms of in terms of corporate taxes, they've gone down. But again, that's a, that's a short-term, one-time effect. Uh, in, and because of the government deficits, taxes will have to go up in the future, and they will go up in the future. Mm-hmm. So yes, feel good now, invest now. But long run, you know, w- what all of this has done is created massive instability in terms of the long run. And nobody- Zombie economy. Oh, it's the zombie economy. <laughs> nobody is fighting for the long-term health of the US economy. Nobody's bringing that up. Nobody's arguing for it. They, you know, if, if the Republicans used to be so-called fiscal conservatives and used to fight for some kind of physical responsibility, which they did under Obama quite successfully and government spending shrunk significantly under Obama, they're not under Trump. They're quite the opposite under Trump. They're spending like there's no tomorrow. Uh, if Republicans 
used to talk about reforming entitlements, which is the largest spend on the, which both the sports markets, primarily the healthcare market, and is bankrupting us. Republicans have stopped talking about reforming entitlements. So the agenda of slowing down spending and the agenda of entitlement reform have been taken off the table by Trump, maybe one of the most damaging things that he's done. And by doing that, yes, feel, you're feeling good now. The economy is doing well now. You're investing money. You, you think you've got more freedom in the short run, but you've also sacrificing your long run uh, viability as a business uh, because at some point, you're going to have to pay for all these things. You, you know, at some point, you know, eight is eight. Reality is what it is. It doesn't, it doesn't move based on your whim or based on Trump's whim. I'm based on...